thank you first for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to be part of this very interesting roundtable. Uh, I titled my presentation Benefits of Hearing Aids Use in Older Adults Epidemiologic Evidence. Of course, I won't make uh, an exhaustive review of epidemiology in this domain, but I understood that um, we had to, uh, to present what we could, each of us, provide uh, to this discussion. So I will focus on two results that we obtained from uh, our studies in Bordeaux. Uh, in this slide, I just wanted, as, an, as a very, very short introduction, remind the large implications of hearing loss in older adults. It is not an exhaustive uh, literature. We have now a lot of results showing that uh, older adults with hearing loss exhibit poorer health condition. Uh, it's something that now we quite well know. Uh, there is an impact on physical health, on falls, on mental health, with many, many studies and more than that, uh, those who, which are reported in the slide. Uh, many studies showing that one of the main consequences are, is the uh, social participation reduction, uh, social isolation, depression, lower quality of life, and many uh, studies now showing that they also exhibit greater cognitive decline and also higher risk of dementia. You, um, you remind this point uh, earlier. So I, I decided not to spare a lot of time detailing this point because I suppose that uh, some of you are, are going to uh, present it better than I would do. Um, what is less evident, what is less known, is whether these um, negative consequences uh, of hearing loss persist when older adults use hearing aids or not. Uh, we have some intuitions and we are all more or less inclined to think, to believe that hearing aids use may have positive impact, but actually we lack uh, formal proof. Uh, we don't have any uh, controlled trial, roundabout trial, providing the formal proof that hearing aids use contribute to diminish such negative impact on health. Um, and uh, we need these formal proofs, but unfortunately we don't have it. But what we now have more and more is epidemiologic data which seem to be consistent and uh, which seem to uh, suggest that hearing aids use uh, is associated with positive impact on mental health. And we have two studies, and that's what I am going to present today, two studies that um, uh, comfort, uh, support this hypothesis. So first of all, um, a few words to, uh, to say that in Bordeaux, in our in SEM laboratory, we are managing for many, many years some epidemiologic cohort studies. Uh, so it's a lab uh, on, um, uh, involving many researchers uh, interested in many domains. And a big team is interesting, interested in epidemiology of aging and cognitive aging. That's the team I am leading. Um, and we are managing three cohort studies, population-based studies, uh, like this one, which is called the PACWIT study, which is the oldest one, actually, and one of the very first which have been set up in Europe since it uh, has been set up in the early 90s. Uh, this uh, cohort study has uh, um, several strengths. The first one is the large sample, at baseline, there were 3,777 participants aged 65 and older uh, who have been included. The second strength is the very long follow-up because every uh, two years, 
uh, the, the participants are visited and receive a trained psychologist who collect a lot of data regarding uh, lifestyle, um, health, and, and well, I, will, I will tell you this point. And um, I was saying that the long follow-up is really a strength of the study because we are right now finishing the 30-year uh, the 30-year uh, follow-up visit of the cohort study. So, so we, are, we are still following up the participants. And this is very important because when we study aging, uh, a lot of factors contributing to, contributing to cognitive aging have small effects. And these small effects are only observable when you have some um, a long period of, of observation. If you just follow up people for two years or three years or five years, um, it's not sufficient. It's not enough to observe, to evidence the effect. You need some very, some long, long time to um, evidence such small effects. And it was probably the case for hearing aids. So the other thing is that at each um, visit, so I remind that the visit is performed at home, at participants' homes, so they are uh, evaluated in their own environment. This is also an important point. And the, tra strain, the trained psychologist collects data regarding sociodemographics, um, lifestyle, comorbidities, drug consumption, uh, cognitive functions with several cognitive tests, including MMSE, verbal fluency, digital simple substitution task, or memory, um, um, visual memory test. We also collect data regarding mental health with in particular case uh, assessing anxiety and depressive symptoms. We also use scales assessing disability with several scales, scales um, assessing instrumental activities of daily living, that is the autonomy of the person using telephone, shopping, preparing food, housekeeping, doing laundry, using transportation, handling medication, handling fin finances, and another scale assessing autonomy in more basic activities of daily living, feeding, continuous transferring, toileting, dressing, and bathing. We also um, have the diagnosis, the clinical diagnosis of dementia. And it's also a very important point uh, because this clinical diagnosis of dementia is obtained uh, within a three-step process, a diagnosis process. First step is the psychologist based on cognitive tests who makes the first screening. Second step, a physician comes at participants' home, physician specialist specialized in dementia, either a neurologist or a geriatrician comes at home and uh, performs a clinical assessment. And third step, all the clinical diagnoses are reviewed by a panel of physicians and all the diagnoses are validated by this uh, panel. So it's a real clinical diagnosis, and not only a diagnosis based on algorithms. It's sometimes the cases in some big cohorts. In this case, it's clinical diagnosis. And another important information which is recorded is death. Um, as uh, I probably said, or I don't know if I, I say it, I said it, but an important thing is that I suppose you understood these studies have not, uh, have not been set up to specifically study the link between hearing loss and dementia, of course. Uh, but we had, fortunately, we had included in this follow-up a question regarding hearing ability. And it's because we had these questions that we found interesting to cross the data and, and uh, look whether there was uh, a relationship between hearing ability and cognitive evolution. So here, we, here are the two questions that have been um, um, included in the clinical assessment. First question, do you have hearing trouble? 
the participant could answer, I do not have hearing trouble, or I have trouble following the conversation with two or more people talking at the same time or in a noisy background, by background sorry, or he could answer, I have major hearing loss. And second question, do you use a hearing yet? Eight, yes or no? So two very simple questions. We had no audiogram at all, no uh, objective measure of hearing loss, just these two questions. So first um, study that we published regarding this question, we just wanted to see whether uh, there was a relationship not only between hearing loss and cognitive decline, but between hearing aids use and cognitive decline, because I, I was really surprised uh, as, I, uh, as I always say, I'm not a specialist in, in this question at all of hearing loss, but as all researcher, I started doing literature to see whether some results have, had been published in, the, in, in this field, and I was really surprised because there were very, very little data uh, regarding hearing aid use and cognitive decline. So I thought it was interesting to, to have a look at our own data. So we uh, used the 25 follow-up of the Packwood study and um, measured, uh, co compared the uh, cognitive evolution using MMSC, which is the more global cognitive test among those um, we used, MMSC. Do I have to, to describe it or MMSC? Yes, maybe? Yeah. yeah. MMSC is a, a test of uh, global cognitive functioning hmm? involving questions regarding um, uh, memory, orientation in time, in space, um, uh, calculation, um, it's a really global test which is very used in geriatrics, very, very used. It's probably the most widely used uh, scale to assess a global alteration in, in an older adult. So we use this test in this study and we compare cognitive performance all along the 25 years of follow-up in those people with hearing loss compared to people with not exhibiting hearing loss. And we found something that we already knew, that is a greater cognitive decline in those older adults with hearing loss. But when we divided the groups, the group with hearing loss in two subgroups, uh, those using hearing aids and use those not using hearing aids, then we found an interesting result. That is, the accelerated decline was only observed in the subgroup not using hearing aids. We didn't find any accelerated decline in those using hearing aids. So that was the main result of this first paper. And I, I thought it was a, a, an interesting result, and I, I've been, I had the opportunity to present it many, many times, and, and, and I, uh, I could uh, uh, understand that it was one of the first results that uh, had been, uh, uh, that were uh, available to evidence such positive potential effect of hearing aid use on cognition. So for this reason, I thought it was inter interesting to go further. And we um, conducted a second series of analysis, always in the uh, Packwood study, but now going further, not only <laughs> considering cognition, but considering what I sometimes call the four Ds of aging. What I call the four Ds of aging is death, depression, disability, and dementia, which have in common many negative points. First, uh, the high prevalence in older age, uh, the fact that they are the main factors of quality of life breakdown in elderly people, uh, the fact that they provide a heavy burden for families who stop being families and become uh, caregivers when such conditions appear. And the other um, common point is that uh, they generate high medical and social costs for the society. Well, except death, 
which is not very costly for society. <laughs> And uh, so, so we performed a similar analysis uh, in the same sample of participants. So this is a, a, a brief description. We had 3,588 um, participants included in the analysis, um, mean age around 76. A majority of uh, two thirds of women, which is quite classical, and so on. More, I don't detail more. And uh, so we tried to calculate the risk of first. Cons we considered death, the risk of death, in three groups: the group of people of elderly people with no hearing loss, the group of elderly people with hearing loss not using hearing aids and the group of people with hearing loss and using hearing aids and the reference group always for this analysis is the uh, group with no hearing loss. Uh, regarding death, it's the only outcome for which we don't have any particular result, so there is not an increased risk of death, but, uh, at least in our study, um, whatever the group hearing uh, with hearing loss, using or not using hearing aids. So we didn't have any significant result regarding death. But we had significant re result regarding dementia. Uh, we found an increased risk of dementia in only in those people with hearing loss and not using hearing aids. There was not Increase, there is no increased risk of dementia induced using hearing aids, and it was quite clear because it was not just a, a problem of uh, statistical power. Because, as you may see, if you understand a little the statistics, the hazard ratio was um, less than one, so it was not just a, a problem of statistical power. Uh, we had the same result for disability. You remember we had two scales, instrumental activities of daily living and activities of daily living, and it was the same result for the two scales, an increased risk of disability only induced not using hearing aids and no increased risk induced using hearing aids. And once again, the statistics were quite clear. And regarding depression, uh, we had an interaction, so the, the results are interesting, but a little bit more difficult to understand. The result was only significant for males. Uh, we had uh, so men with uh, uh, hearing loss and not using hearing aids were, uh, uh, had an increased risk of depression, and those not using hearing aids uh, had no increased risk of depression, and it was less evident for women. So uh, if we consider these two studies, we can see that uh, there is an increased risk of cognitive decline, of depression, particularly in men, of dementia, of disability in older adults with hearing loss, and we do not observe this increased risk in those using hearing aids. That's what the conclusion we can uh, get from these two studies. Once again, I insist these results are not gathered from clinical trials, which are specifically designed for this purpose, so it's important to, to um, insist and uh, underline this limit, but we do have consistent results from epidemiology suggesting the positive impact of hearing aids on mental health. So taken together, I think that um, all these results underline the importance of seriously considering hearing loss in older people, and in particular, if you have in mind this um, slide or uh, this issue. Uh, we know now uh, that a lot of factors contribute to brain pathological aging. A long series, a long list of factors contribute to modulate cognitive aging, either positively or negatively. Genetics, education, income, leisure activities, social network, personality traits, occupation, attrition, physical activity, sensory functions, and I could still 
make longer the list. But actually, among this long list of factors contributed to cognitive aging and pathological aging, only few of them are really modifiable. What can we do about, on genetics? Nothing. What can we do on education? Nothing. Income is hardly modifiable, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Personally, <laughs> personally traits is hardly modifiable, also occupation and so on. There are only a few of them which are modifiable. We can mm, keep in this slide leisure activities, social network, nutrition, physical activity, sensory function. And even, even among these ones, they are not so easily modifiable. If we take the example of social network, if, are, if you are 80, um, you, you don't have any children, your friends are dead, uh, you're alone and you have been alone nearly all your life because you don't have a lot of friends or uh, what can really do the person to increase his or her social network is really difficult. It's the same for leisure activities. If you have been, if you've never been to a theater, you don't start going to a theater at 80. So they are theoretically modifiable, but it's, they are not so easily modifiable factors. The only factors probably on which we have more possibility to act, I don't know what you, what you think, is probably the third Last ones, nutrition, physical activity, and sensory functions. We can do something on these factors. So that's, to my opinion, the reason why this message is really important. The message of considering hearing loss and treating hearing loss is really important when um, uh, we consider cognitive aging and pathological aging. So that's the end of my presentation, just the name of the persons who work on these large and important uh, population-based studies. Thank you.